Hey there friends, Dave Polite of Scanning and Missing Project, copyrighted edition of our video channel. And this is a missing persons video, just missing people. And uh, before I get going any further, I got this card sent to me by a lady named Linda. A card in a card. Kind of the way Huck looked when uh, she was a pup. Thank you, Linda, for the gracious, polite, kind note you wrote and the card. And uh, you guys are all very, very kind to us. And it is very much appreciated. So, we got some fascinating missing persons cases, some fascinating letters, and a variety of other things to talk about today. So, we're gonna get right into it. First letter, Dave, since granite seems to be a connection in some of the disappearances, just thought I'd share this. It's from someone who went into great de detail about the King's Chamber and the Great Pyramid of Giza. Quote, the speed of sound in air is 343 meters per second. Through granite, the speed of sound is 6,000 meters per second. So sound travels 17 and a half times faster through granite than it does through air. Sound propagates much, much faster through granite. Sound does more rapidly. Sound goes more rapidly through a thicker and denser medium, whereas light stops. I didn't know that. Another interesting fact about granite. Now, if you're new to this, granite is associated with disappearances. The largest cluster in the world is, that's right, Yosemite National Park. What location for a national park has the most granite anywhere? Yosemite National Park. Now, does that mean that granite is involved in the disappearances? I have no idea. I just report the facts. Just the facts. Next letter. Morning, Dave. I've been reading the Annie Jacobson book, Operation Paperclip. If you don't know what Operation Paperclip is, look it up. And I found a very eye-raising references beginning in the paperback edition. It's a section that is discussing the Nazi scientists and their experiments here in the US after being brought over here. It seems they used LSD in experiments in the US along with the CIA to see if LSD could be used as an interrogation drug. Well, not only could it, could it, but it also had the effect of erasing the memory after the interrogation was taking place. This reminds me of not only the UFO abduction cases, but also of missing persons cases when they are found. They have no memory of where, when it took place. Here's an excerpt from the book. It begins on page 367. The two individuals being interrogated at Camp King safe house could be classified as experienced professional type agents and suspected of working for the Soviet intelligence. These were Soviet spies captured by the Gelen organization now being run by the CIA. In the first case, light dosages of drugs coupled with hypnosis were used to induce, induce a complete hypnotic trance, the memo reveals. The trance was held for approximately one hour and 40 minutes of interrogation with the subsequent total amnesia produced. The plan was straightforward. Drug the spies, interrogate the spies, and give them an amnesia to make them forget. So, let's go back to Skinwalker Ranch for a second. The entity at the ranch didn't need anything to get you to con talk. It could obviously read the minds of the people, people involved. It could predict what was happening. This was stated by multiple research teams. So if that entity was involved in our disappearances, as somebody from the Defense Intelligence Agency states, then they wouldn't need a drug to assist them. Now that's just for the mind part of it. Now, for the complete relaxation, lack of movement, maybe they do need a drug. I don't know. I've just reported the facts. And the facts were is that GHB had been used 
on a couple of different people in the books where the parents did a secondary autopsy. It was found in their blood in high levels. Now people have asked me, Dave, where does GHB comes from? Well, ironically, your body produces GHB. Now, is there some way externally that some entity has found to turn that faucet on your production of GHB and have a self-induced state produced by GHB that you made? I don't know. Next layer. Hey Dave, I've been a fan of yours since I first heard you on Coast to Coast AM. I'm also a law enforcement officer and can relate with a lot of what you say in your videos. Working the overnight shift, I would be graveyard, here in Coast to Coast got me through rough nights. Been wanting to write you for a long time about a story told to me by my dad. This happened in 1996 while he traveled from Piedras Negras, Mexico to San Antonio, Texas. My dad passed away from COVID in August of 2021, which made me want to tell the story more urgently. I was about eight years old, and me and my brother, who was 10 at the time, were staying with my mom in Piedra Negras, Mexico, border to Eagle Pass, Texas. My mom was going through some legal issues and could not come back into the USA. Eventually, she settled the legal issues, but that's another story. My dad made many road trips between that city and San Antonio. In one of those road trips back to San Antonio, my dad was driving on a lonely stretch of US 57, where not even a service station is seen for up to an hour. It was around 2 a.m. when his 1988 Nissan 240SX began to have transmission issues and he had to stop. My dad planned to spend the night on the side of the highway until the morning. Keep in mind, this was still in the time of a lot of people did not have a cell phone and my dad was one of them. So there was not much he could do but wait till morning and see what happened. My dad, attempting to catch some rest, was suddenly startled by a vehicle that stopped by his vehicle. The driver rolled down the window and said, I cannot give you a ride because I'm not allowed, but you cannot stay here. The driver then left. My dad, being a religious man, believed that this was a messenger or angel giving him a warning not to stay there. So my dad grabbed his Bible and abandoned his vehicle and began to run as fast as he could. He eventually got tired but continued with the last walk, with the fast walk. My dad says he kept praying in his mind and was fearful. He said he was hardly saw any cars during the time he was on foot. At around 4 a.m., a van stopped and it was a man and his mother on the way to San Antonio. The man told my dad that he had seen his abandoned vehicle and figured it was him. He also said he was feeling sleepy and could use some company. So my dad made it safely home and later picked up his car with a friend. My dad repeated this story several more times as we grew up. I always felt a haunting feeling every time I heard it. I can also notice my dad feeling the same thing when he would tell the story. It was not until I came across Missing 411 that I made the connection. I really believe in my heart, if my dad had not listened to the stranger's warning, I would have lost my dad at a much younger age. My dad enjoyed a great life and I miss him every day. I am more careful every time I go into the woods or wilderness, and my deepest sympathies for your son, Ben. I'm also a father and I can't imagine what you have been through. Thanks for all you do. Thanks for all you do for our safety and service to the community. Let me talk about that for a second. Missing persons and investigations of missing persons depends entirely on law enforcement doing their research. And right now, they have a tough time recruiting law enforcement people. There aren't enough people that want the job. The reason they don't want the job is there's a perception out there that they aren't appreciated by the administration and the public. I greatly believe that that perception is skewed entirely by our media. I know too many people that don't appreciate, that do wholeheartedly appreciate you, law enforcement, doing your job. Our society would not exist in a sane manner if it wasn't for you. And there are administrations throughout the U.S. that do appreciate you, and you just need to find them. 
I can guarantee you that here in Montana, we appreciate law enforcement greatly. I was recently in a small cafe, really small, maybe 10, t 10 tables. And I walked in and sitting at the table right next to me were uh, five Montana state troopers. They're out of a meeting, obviously. And over the course of maybe 45 minutes I was there, at least three or four people came up to that table and said how much they appreciated those people, those officers. Made me feel good. Made me feel really good. And I think we need to do that more. I think I've told you before that I bought lunch for officers before in restaurants never said anything just walked out no need to say that i am the one put my chest out that did it i just did it because i wanted those people to know they were appreciated and someone cared and as our society starts and continues to slip it's those men and women on the front lines that we need more than anything in any time in our history that's enough Next letter. Hey Dave, let me begin my condolences over Ben. He seemed like a brilliant young man and I'm truly sorry that the world will be much darker without his physical presence. Fortunately, not many know your pain and grief, nor do they know the weight of the cross that you will always bear. I carry a similar one. My only child, Gabriel, was murdered five years ago on my 40th birthday. He had just turned 18 less than two weeks earlier. He was a brilliant, light and like with ben the world's a bit dimmer for everyone without him here he was my son little brother best friend and future he was my compass as well oh i know that feeling i'm writing for two reasons the first and main one is to ask you if you have had any synchronistic things happen i don't mean the superficial things that people on the internet seem to give value to you. example the clock showing 222 two, two, or finding dimes in weird places though I do not discount those I'm talking about life-altering glimpses into something much more complex about a year ago I saw a 411 episode where you talked about an encounter with Robert Bigelow and Leslie Keene that you had and how it seemed synchronized it sure did oh, it sure did I've had several myself that go beyond explanation, beginning with my son's death on my own birthday. I'm familiar with parad parad paradolia, seeing patterns where there are none, and I promise it is not that. I would describe them here, but it would take a couple of pages, and I'm sure you get a ton of mail. If you would care to hear or think about that, there's something in the synchronicities second reason for this email is to offer a possibility that I've thought of regarding the missing. Could it be possible that the 411 tragedy, tragedies are connected to a hidden breakaway society? I've always had an interest in World War II and technology that was developed after, and I'm sure that you know of a large Nazi contingent moved to South America immediately after 1945. Yeah, Argentina primarily. That is fact. Further down the rabbit hole, many believe that Hitler and some high-ranking officers of his made it to Antarctica and either created or were accepted into a separate civilization. I myself find it curious that in 4647, Admiral Byrd led Operation High Jump to Antarctica. I think that this could explain the high number of Germans that go missing. It could also help explain some of the coincidences regarding a lot of the missing. What comes to mind is your case when a child disappeared from his family and at the same time a similar family with the same last name was in the same park. Yosemite and the Key family. Could these Nazis, for lack of a better term, have access to hospital records, standardized tests, etc.? And that is why sometimes the missing are eerily similar in description and location. Just a thought. I'm leaving my contact information in case you think there's anything on either topic. I'm sure you're busy and I don't... If, uh, thank you so much for your research and the village that you and Ben have created. I found your channel in 2017 after I lost my son. Your strength and commitment to your mission has inspired me and at times gotten my mind off my own loss. The gift has been priceless to me. Thank you very much. Oh, Jeff. 
He signed it, Jeff. Loss of a son is horrendous. I really try not to, to dwell on it. It's not, it's not the act of not thinking about Ben. It's not thinking about him being here. As many of you have stated that Ben's probably standing over my shoulder somewhere saying, come on, Dad, come on, you can do this. Well, Dad could do it, but he'd rather do it with you here. Next letter. The more I read your books, the more perplexed I am overall. Let me stop there for a second. I get a lot of letters from people who obviously have never read my books. And I get that. And a large percentage of them propose a theory. And as an example, today, a very large production company in the world called me and was doing an inquiry to see if I was going to be interested in working with them on something, on a project. And the person on the other end said, David, what's your theory on what's going on? I get this all the time. And I politely said, well, one thing I could say with certainty is it's not a serial killer as we know it. And she says, why? And I said, well, the case is going back to the 1600s on 16 countries it would be impossible. Oh, yeah. But when I get the when I get people who haven't read the books and propose a theory, and I've answered the same question a thousand times, I contemplate whether just dumping the inquiry or sending a statement. And my first gut is, come on, just go to your library and read the books. Uh. Anyhow, on with the story. I read a bit about berry pickers, and in that moment, I was thankful that blackberries grow along the property line here. Why does that give you comfort? I've had people disappear on their own property hundreds of times. We often pick berries in the summer to bake fresh blackberry pies. I don't know that I will ever wander as much as I did in my youth into the deep, unforgiving forest again, just putting that out there. Now, I have noticed in several stories you mentioned that people vanish within very close proximity to others without a trace. You have, you have both children and adults in this scenario. My, my, my rational mind first went to maybe the reporting party was in too much trauma to accurately report important details like window of time or anything seen or heard. Perhaps the missing subject fell into a hidden orifice that somehow others miss on the search party, but that seems fantastical. So I set that aside. Fantastical and improbable. And almost impossible. Because canines would track right to the location where the person fell. Perhaps the missing subject... Okay. Can persons in stress and trauma report inaccuracy every fine detail in the moment? I do not have enough chunk of my time invested in researching the psychology of that to really make a reasonable argument. So I'm merely putting in here something to consider. Well, as someone who has been under fantastical stress in a law enforcement career, who had to accurately write reports, yeah, I think it's possible and it's very likely that this happens regularly. I consider every approach as I think about this sort of scenario. Was there something in the trees that somehow pulled the missing subject up and muffled their mouth fast enough to prevent he or she from crying out for help? Was it an invisible force that completely absorbed the subject? Did the subject step through a doorway somehow missed by those ahead and the doorway is in a ripple of space-time which transfers them to an alternate dimension? This scenario drives my mind into those mystifying places because I cannot reasonably con conjure up a solution to how they vanish so quickly and without a trace. 
We can easily rule out animal encounter as our natural response is to scream to alert those in the party that this animal is mauling us or kidnapping us. Plus, in animal predation cases, the area where the attack occurred, if it's dirt, it'll be very disturbed. There'll be blood, torn clothing, hair from the animal, drag marks. I have working theories which consist of many things. One was that it was a pre-planned kidnapping performed by humans who live off the grid. I'm sorry, I've heard this many times. In Montana, probably 80% of everyone here who hikes in the mountains carries a gun. In Colorado, it was probably like 60 or 70%. If this was happening, I think there'd be shootings and killings of these people in the woods. And if these people lived in the woods, I think search and rescue would find them. I think fire crews would find their structures, their living areas, it just isn't happening. It doesn't hold much water and I don't have a working motive. This is just the most grounded theory I have. Another is that the missing glitch out of existence into a parallel universe because if we are to believe the Matrix theory, a glitch would easily erase a character quickly. Strange, stranger still, I consider an advanced civilization of ultra-terrestrials scratching, snatching the missing for means of study and re-education. Perhaps to tag their animal, to one say release again if the missing doesn't die in the process. Sometimes I consider the cryptid, as you know as Bigfoot, as he would be in the trees like a primate. However, Bigfoots are known to have a very pungent smell. This is only a small collection of thoughts. I share without a lengthy backing for every individual argument to sell each theory. And now you too have probably much considered similar thoughts on disappearing people. Why wouldn't you? The fact that someone can vanish so close to his or a group, scariest. Thank you for the open investigation. It keeps the village, including myself, in constant thought. So, a lot of you have gotten on to Mr. Bigelow about why he hasn't released all of his research. Well, number one, it's his research. He can do with it what he wants. Just like this is my research. I've chose to be an open book about it. I've chose to present it to the public and I've taken many people, decided to just ratchet me into the crazy part of this world and say, oh, Dave's lying, Dave's this, Dave's that, whatever, do whatever you want. I don't care. Facts are facts. And if you can't live with those, move on. So about the tree scenario, something picking you up and pulling you into the tree. Again, the canines would track you to the tree. And we'd be looking up and we'd be trying to find some evidence that you were in the tree. And if you were in the tree, where did you go after you were in the tree? Next email. I will delay my initial email to you about my experiences, which include Hyde's strangeness as a young man. Please know that my background is in military intelligence and support of counterterrorism. I've also worked alongside law enforcement. In fact, most of my friends are current and former law enforcement or military. I will add is that I intuitive skills played a large role in my life and contributed to my successes in both military and consulting. First, I deeply appreciate you for your service in law enforcement and continued service by helping through these investigations. I hope to one day to be able to actively contribute. Enough talking. In connection to the issue of young men missing in urban environments or closely related cases, in short terms, I strongly suspect that there may be an organized group of people responsible, in part or whole. So, another person who probably hasn't read my books. People who are disappearing in urban areas, they, make, they happen all over the world, not just in the U.S., not just in Canada. So, is there a worldwide campaign to do this? Going back decades and decades and decades? I find that very hard to believe. This group would profile or as has a structure of a sorority both 
involving members both past and present. Hate to sound like a charter member of the HEMA Woman Hating Club, but based on both insight and research, it is a distinct possibility. Please note a significant span of time occurs between the time of becoming missing and being found. There are a number of factors that indicates an inside job. Excuse me, I hate I hate watching somebody that yawns that buck sag at me. And meeting places such as bars or clubs, thus access to any security records. Also, the use of GHV as one tool is also likely, and that would fit the profile of a group of women targeting young men. It's only the bare skeleton of a concept, but I am currently without real the sources to lay the foundation of a serious investigation as I am overseas. I send books overseas every day. Please note that I am happily married to a wonderful lady. I have a 16-year-old son through the marriage. I'm currently waiting for the federal government to hear to make the final approval. Please reply when you can, when you feel that my theory is completely off base. Please be blunt. I think it's completely off base. It doesn't fit the facts we have doesn't fit the scenarios we've written about. Again, I only hope to contribute to your work. I'm deeply concerned with the targeting of individuals, especially young children. All the best. Thank you for your kind and informative note. Hey Dave, just curious, and I apologize if you said, and I've missed it, what is your preferred caliber of pistol when you're out in nature? Thanks for all you do. Now, I, I know I'm talking to people that have never had a firearm in their hand. I'm talking to people who have fired thousands of rounds through a firearm, pistol, rifle. I've got people from all over the gamut on this topic listening and watching. So first of all, unless you're a trained professional, I really don't recommend semi-automatic pistols to people. A revolver works just fine. It is almost fail safe and they work. A couple years ago a friend convinced me to buy a 50 caliber Smith & Wesson pistol because they knew I was moving to Grizz territory. Bought the gun, wanted a 4 inch, got it. 4 inch stainless Smith, really nice gun. So I went to the range, I fired that gun a total of three times. I took the bullets out, cleaned it, and sold it the next day. Why? So I'm 6'1", 200 pounds. That gun hurt my hand to shoot it. So I said, I will never do that again. I fired literally tens of thousands of rounds through my Colt Commander that I carried on duty on the SWAT team. Tens of thousands of rounds. Never hurt. Uh, I carry right now a Glock 10 millimeter when I'm in grizzly territory with bare loads. It doesn't hurt. It's a tremendous pistol. I wouldn't recommend anybody carrying it that isn't very, very, very experienced. So, my recommendation is if you want to carry a firearm, get professionally trained by somebody. Go to a range and say, hey, I want to be trained on this gun. And then fire hundreds of rounds through it before you take it anywhere. Hundreds and hundreds of rounds. I know it's expensive. But that is your lifeline. Why wouldn't you become proficient with it? Exactly. Shoot it in dark conditions and bright conditions, not just all on the light. So, no experience, start off shooting with a 22 long rifle pistol, just so you can start shooting a gun and move your way up. Go up to a 38 caliber pistol. Then, if you're going to bear territory, you're going to have to move up to a 44 Magnum pistol. And it's a big jump. It's going to take two hands to shoot it for most people. But get lessons. Understand what loads mean in cartridges and bullets. A load means how heavy a load, how, how well compacted that that bullet is when you shoot it. A light load means the bullet isn't really going that fast. A heavy load means it's really flying. So, a lot to learn. 
it's it's a very strange world out there with pistols and I would say that if you get somebody who's training you who claims to be an expert and you don't like them and you don't like the way they're training you just dump them there's a lot of people out there that are really competent on training people there's a school named Jeff Cooper in Arizona I think it's one of the best schools in the world to learn how to shoot really competently it's probably where I'd send if Ben was around that's where I'd send him to become a really good shot and competent with a semi-automatic pistol next note hey Dave I wanted to reach out and say thank you for all you do, especially with how much you talk about mental health and suicide. We live in Oregon. No one has mental health issues here, supposedly. Ha 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 ha. We live in Oregon. No one, uh, yeah. Getting the help you need is almost impossible. It's taboo to have a mental health issue. It's so ridiculous. Anyway, I've thought it for most of my 30 year marriage that my husband is bipolar. He has so many things and so many signs. He's taken off to kill himself four times now, each time ending in a mental breakdown. When I have been able to get him in for care, and that's a monumental challenge in itself, they have always poo-pooed it. You don't have that. Whatever. Needless to say, he's never received any help. I hear the same thing from so many people in many groups regularly. It's horrifically sad. Nothing ever good comes from sweeping things under the rug. 100% true. Anyway, thank you for speaking out about mental health. It's nice to know I'm not alone. You need more good men like you. Thank you for your time and energy. I know Ben is very proud of you. I hope so. So, I've said it before, I'll say it again. If you're watching, get into a NAMI group, N-A-M-I. Groups are for family and for people suffering from bipolar and associated mental illnesses. They are very, very kind people, very intelligent, and can really give good direction and help. And these support groups are people like you and me have gone through it, and uh, they can help a lot. And you can attend with your husband. It's an eye-opening experience. If it was me, I'd drive hundreds of miles just to go to the meetings. It's that valuable. I've gone through a 12-week course. It's one of the best courses I've ever been to. NAMI, N-A-M-I. All right, missing persons cases. We're in the summertime, and thankfully, there haven't been that many so far that fit our profile. But I'm going to talk about a case in New York. First two cases are in New York, and they're pretty intriguing. Doctor, physician, Douglas Schultz, 34 years old, Missing November 4th, 1961, Siamese Lakes, New York, Upper Adirondacks area. He was a psychiatrist in Brooklyn who liked to deer hunt. He contacted a hunting guide named Harry Wilbert. Harry was 65 years old, very experienced outfitter, especially in deer hunting in that Adirondack area. Dr. Schultz stated that he wanted to go to a remote area where there was good hunting and price wasn't an issue. So Wilbert hired a float plane that flew the pair into Siamese Lakes. Siamese Lakes is located just south east from Indian Lake. A lot of strange things at Indian Lake. Google it. And they flew in that area is now a wilderness area and no planes are allowed, but in 61, they were allowed. Well, Wilbur decided that he was going to flank around the backside and bring in the deer so that Douglas could have a shot. This is very reminiscent of many cases I've talked about where a deer hunter was sitting, somebody went around to push the deer towards them, and that hunter disappeared. If you watch Missing 411 The Hunted, this should ring true to you. So anyhow, the guy did this, 
ended up back in the location where Schultz was supposedly seating, searched the area multiple times, didn't find him. Well, he was stuck at the lake until the seaplane came back. When it came back, the seaplane used its radio to call for New York State Fish and Game. And the New York Conservation Department did respond in, in bulk. So this was a physician, a big time disappearance in the world of the New York Conservation Department. Temps were very cold at night. 500 people responded and did the ground search. They had three airplanes that flew for four days. They searched the area around the lakes multiple, multiple times, including dragging Siamese Lake many, many times. Now this region is a cluster zone of missing people. It's, it's a strange place. And even today, look up Siamese ponds. They called it lake back then, but it was really, it's really called Siamese ponds now. And here it is. Here's Indian Lake. And this is Speculator, New York. This area right in here has tons of water and is ultra thick vegetation. I looked at it on a map and I really don't understand why the outfitter took them there. It'd be hard to hunt because there's no open areas. But decades, decades later, Dr. Douglas Schultz was never found. As I stated, this is a cluster area, tons of water. He's in a subgroup of missing hunters. He's also in a second subgroup of missing physicians and intellects. And you had point of separation between him and the outfitter. Now, I told you, and I've told people before, watch Missing 411, The Hunted. In that case in New York, yeah, New York, the same place where Schultz disappeared, is where Tom Messick, uh, an elderly hunter, was seated, and his son and a group of other friends uh, of the hunters that Messick was with all pushed deer around, Messick disappeared. That was in 2015. He still has never been found. I encourage you to watch our video. It'd be for free, and you can find it right under the links below. And it has been on YouTube, Hulu, <coughs> and Amazon. You can find it. Missing 411, The Hunted. Next case. This involved a man named George Bombardier, 55 years old. Missing November 29th, 1971 at 5 p.m. What's the most common time to disappear? 4 p.m. Now, Bombardier disappeared just eight miles away from a case I've done on here, on this channel before, involving Harriet Olson, a housewife who disappeared under very unusual circumstances. Well, George, just like Schultz, was a lifetime hunter, very experienced as Schultz. And he loved deer hunting so much, he bought his own deer hunting camp and business. He uh, was from Rouse Point, and he had worked for the Delaware Railroad for 28 years. The articles that we reviewed for this had three different dates of the disappearance. This is so common with older articles. But the one we're going with is November 29th, which was the most common. Now, he told his family that he was going to go hunting, deer hunting on a site. He'd be back at 5 p.m. He didn't come back. About the time he was supposed to be back, bad weather sets in, rain, snow. And the family called the New York Conservation Department wardens, and they came out and started a search. They searched for five days in horrendous weather. They found the truck exactly where George said it would be. So, George Bombardier disappeared just east of a town called Paul Smith's. 
I know that's a weird name for a town, but it's called Paul Smith's. And he disappeared 35 miles north of where George Schultz disappeared. And Harriet disappeared just eight miles away. There's many other disappearances in this area as well. So, Schultz disappearance, Bombardier disappearance, 35 miles approximately. So, what is it about Upper New York, Adirondacks area, Lake Placid? What is it about that area? Yeah, there's, there's thick woods, but there aren't the predators out there like we have in Montana. And none of these cases are predation cases. But Bombardier disappears. There's a week and a half search by family, friends, New York Conservation. They supply air support, nothing. In May of 1972, about six months afterwards, there's another big search for George. They found nothing. Now, the family stated emphatically there was no way George was lost. They said absolutely impossible. He knew that area better than anyone. Now, let's think about George Bombardier and Harriet Olson, a housewife who disappeared eight miles away. A mature man and a mature woman disappear eight miles apart. Both had medical conditions. George had a blood condition that needed daily medication. They never stated exactly what it was, but he needed daily meds. Harriet had a medical condition. Both were alone. Both were never found and water was everywhere. Uh, I read so many of these cases that it's, it's mind boggling and it's sad that these people aren't found and the families can't understand what really happened. How many people know what a World Heritage Site is? Well, if I tell you, you'll probably forget, so I, that's your homework assignment for today. Go, to, go look up the World Heritage Site in UNESCO because the next location I'm gonna to talk to you about was a UNESCO World Heritage Site. This is Mount Kinabalu in Brunei. It's the tallest mouth, mountain in Southeast Asia. And the elevation, according to multiple locations, was 13,454 feet. It varies depending on the site you look at. It's known as an easy peak to climb because there's a pretty identifiable path with ropes and there's huts built along the way where you can get shelter in bad weather. And there's guest homes at the bottom of the mountain and at the lower elevations where you can stay and they get an early start on the mountain. So October 22nd, 1988, five employees from a bottling company not far from the mountain decided that they were as a team going to climb the mountain. Well, again, well-marked trail with ropes. At 12,500 feet, two of them told the other three that they were going to stay right there, that they were tired, they were out of breath, and they'd wait there for the friends to go up. And that was 26-year-old Boon Heng and 34-year-old Lao Thong. They were going to wait right there. So the other three moved up the mountain trying to summit. As they were moving up, rain and wind was moving up the mountain. The three friends came back down the mountain, looked for Thong and Hang, where they last saw them, couldn't locate them, called out their name, looked everywhere. Well, when they couldn't locate them, they came down the mountain and notified rangers. Rangers, because this is a national park in Brunei. Start paying attention to national parks in other countries. They have similar things happening as our national parks. 
Well, Brunei didn't give it some half effort like some U.S. searches. 30 park rangers committed 60 days to searching for these two men. And what they determined was is that part of the issue when people climb this mountain is that there was no place in 1971 or correct that in 1988 to hide to get cover so the government decided to build these huts along the way so when bad weather came in the people could find some place to hide out wait for it to pass and they constructed these huts and it's now required that if you climb that mountain you have to file the rope line, follow the rope line, and you have to stay in the huts in bad weather. Now, in this incident, you had point of separation. You had weather. There was no place to for cover, and they were above tree line. And this is a cluster zone of disappearances, and you're going to see why. So, we have this occurring in 1988. So, almost 36 years later, still have never been found. Look at the mountain online, Kinabalu, K-I-N-A-B-A-L-U. And you're going to see, there's, not, there's no tree coverage up there high. Where they went is the million dollar question. I have no idea. But in August 16, 2001, history repeats itself. Ellie James, 17 years old. She was hiking with her family from Cornwall, England. And they were hiking with a group of British trekkers going up the mountain. Near the back of the pack was Ellie and her 15-year-old brother. Rain and wind started to set in. Her 15-year-old brother, Henry, started to get tired. And he said he wanted to go back down. So she said she'd go with him. They started to go back down, and then he said he didn't feel good, and was tired and he, ju he just was going to wait for the others. Well, Ellie said she was going to go down and get help and come back. So she went headed down the mountain. The British group that was trekking with his parents came back down the mountain and found Henry. Asked where Ellie was and he said Ellie went down. So they all went down the mountain. They get to the bottom of the mountain, Ellie's not there. So they call for the rangers, and there's a massive search. They don't find anything. But during the search, several of the rangers reported hearing somebody calling for help. They called back, didn't get a response, and they get another call, help me, help me. Friends out there, if you remember, at Mesa Verde National Park and the disappearance of Dale Staling, a reporter was out on the trail and heard somebody calling for help, came back and reported that to the park superintendent. He stated, hey, there's somebody missing in that area. And another witness heard the same thing yesterday. We went out and searched and never found him then. So they sent out searchers again, never found anyone in the area where the reporter heard the person calling for help. Very strange. So the search for on Kinabalu for Ellie James was massive. Didn't find her, even though others heard the cry for help. On the sixth day of the search, at 12,270 feet, far above the location where she separated from her brother Henry, and Henry saw her going downhill, they find her body face down at the bottom of a cliff, a steep cliff. An area that searchers stated they had already been through many times and didn't find her. And Henry stated that her sister was, his sister was going down, not up. So how did she get by Henry on the trail without him seeing her? And how did she go up instead of down? Very peculiar. But the more I do this research, the more I find these connections. Now, in Missing 411 Vanished, where we did the Stalin case, uh, and the ranger heard this, it reminded others of a, of a situation where somebody's picked up by a portal, and they're somewhat entrapped in this portal, and they can see out, 
but you can't see in. They know they're missing and they're calling for help and they're asking for assistance. You can hear them, but they can't hear you. Could that be what's happening? I have no idea. But it seems very peculiar. Now in 1978, a young man named Ing Chong was on a school trip on Mount Kinabalu, on a school outing. He disappeared, was never found. The only thing they did find of his were his shoes. There was very little information about the case other than he disappeared, he wasn't found, but they did find his shoes. And on that mountain, disappearing without your shoes is crazy. Lots of sharp rocks, sharp edges. I can't imagine anybody going up there without shoes. But this was a young schoolboy, so what could have happened to him is the million dollar question. But there's a group of people on that mountain that have never been found. That makes no sense. That has no logical answer. And the person that was found even adds more intrigue. I would have liked to have known how long she was deceased when she was found. Did she die the first day after Henry saw her move away or did she die days later? I don't know. But I will tell you that what has happened on Mount Kinabalu has happened on other mountains in the world with similar strangeness and, and no answers. So I don't, I don't hold myself to just North America. As I've stated before, I have 16 other countries I've, been, I've written about where these have happened. So remember, go back, find out what a World Heritage Site is. Then look up the World Heritage Sites in the United States. Kind of weird. So that's your missing person segment for today. I greatly appreciate you being here. Please put these stories on social media. If you guys look under the video section where you can put comments on this video, I go through and read all the videos, comments, and I try to give you a thumbs up. 90% of the time I can't. And I know a lot of you say that your comments have been removed. I don't know who's doing it because you tell me what the comments are and it's nothing I'd be doing. So it's perplexing, but uh, understandable. I hope you have a great, great summer day. Do something kindly for anyone. If you have a couple packs of canned stew food, go drop them off at your local food bank. See somebody who's in distress, go help them. We're all going to be there one of these days, friends. We're all going to be old and aged, if God's willing. And when people do those little things for us, it's going to be appreciated. That's why if you do it for them now, they're going to really appreciate it. Take care. Politis out.